During World War II, British and American aviators were asked to do something that no one had ever done before. Hunt down and engage enemy aircraft under the cover of darkness. This was a far cry from night flying in today's combat aircraft. Pilots were left with literally nothing but a radio and their naked eyes to guide them as they scanned the horizon for inbound bombers. During this anxious time, pilots reported seeing more than just inbound Nazi aircraft, however. On more than one occasion, they reported unusual lights that would follow them through the sky or would even react to their presence. Stories of these strange objects, which were soon called Foo Fighters, would take the United States by storm in December of 1944 after a story about it was published by the Associated Press. All at once, America's love affair with these strange Foo Fighters and subsequent stories about flying saucers were born. Just three years later, a reported saucer crash near the sleepy town of Roswell, New Mexico would once again garner national attention. Just a year after that, an Air National Guard P-51 Mustang was dispatched to intercept a flying saucer over North Dakota, and four years after that, flying saucers were spotted flying above the White House, this time prompting the Air Force to launch a bevy of F-94 Starfires to go intercept. In the late 1940s and throughout the 1950s, stories about flying saucers weren't just the crackpot rantings of tinfoil-clad conspiracy theorists here. They were legitimate concerns among a number of senior defense officials, substantiated by reports coming in from various parts of the nation's military apparatus. It's not surprising, then, that in the 1950s, the United States and its allies in Canada sought to develop a flying saucer of their very own, one that could fly at extraordinary speeds and altitudes, hover over battlefields, and dominate the skies for decades to come. The culmination of those efforts came to be known as the Avro Canada VZ-9 Avro Car, or as most of us know it today, America's Flying Saucer. While pop culture ties to the flying saucer shape may well have influenced the Avro Car's design, it was actually a burgeoning interest in vertical takeoff and landing, or VTOL, platforms that may have been the program's most significant driving factor. America's atomic bomb attacks on Japan in 1947, followed by the Soviets' atomic tests in 1949, made it seem clear that any new major conflict on the European continent would begin with nuclear strikes, and these strikes would likely eliminate military installations, as well as their accompanying airstrips, throughout much of the region. As such, an emphasis was placed on developing VTOL platforms that could take off and land without the need for the long airstrips that were constructed to support the advanced fighters and bombers of World War II. In order to achieve this VTOL capability, Avrocar's Jack Frost aimed to use the exhaust from the turbojet engines to drive a circular turbo rotor that would produce a cushion of thrust beneath a circular aircraft. This would allow the Avrocar to hover at low altitudes, the thrust from the engines could then be directed backward, pushing the aircraft forward and, according to their design, allow it to operate like a highly capable fighter. And the basis behind that really may have been tied to this Foo Fighter legend, because as Pilmyro Compagna, an author and engineer with the Canadian Department of National Defense, once said, quote, Frost believed that the Germans had developed some sort of flying saucer-like aircraft. Part of that belief stemmed from the stories and newspaper articles that appeared back in the 1950s. Now, it's unclear as to whether the Canadian government actually supported Frost's theory that the Nazis had flying saucers, but they did begin to provide initial funding for his own program starting in 1952. Within a year, Frost and his team had produced a wooden mock-up of their own flying saucer design, and as tends to happen, images of this flying saucer made their way to the press. The Canadian government felt understandably obligated to make a comment, so they came forward and said, yeah, we are developing our own flying saucer-like fighter, and even more, it's going to reach speeds as high as 1,500 miles per hour and be able to take off and fly completely vertically. Now, those numbers might not seem insane to you because we've seen aircraft do this since, but at the time, some of the best jets in use in the world, for instance, the U.S. military's F-86 Sabre, were significantly slower. The F-86 topped out at around 690 miles per hour, and, as you may have guessed, couldn't hover or take off vertically. 
But despite Canada's public statements about the Avrocar, they were actually more interested in other new aviation programs than Frost's seemingly promising flying saucer. And for years, funding was pretty tough to come by. That is, until 1958, when the United States Department of Defense started eyeing the unusual aircraft as a possible solution for two very distinct problems they were facing. At around this same time, the United States was also heavily investing in new and novel approaches to warfare, and much like today, the different branches of America's armed forces had distinct needs that they were looking to meet. The U.S. Army was on the market for a subsonic aircraft that could be used for both reconnaissance and as a general-purpose troop transport for varied terrain. The Avrocar's VTOL capabilities made it well-suited for quick landings to dispense troops in combat zones, and based on Frost's assertions about its performance capabilities, this Canadian flying saucer seemed a viable fit. The Air Force, on the other hand, were primarily concerned with an aircraft that could take off and land without runways, due to that likelihood of nuclear war. And they wanted to be able to hover while operating beneath enemy radar, and then blast off at supersonic speeds when necessary to intercept inbound fighters or bombers. Frost's research from the Avrocar program suggested to the Pentagon that the VZ-9 Avrocar could meet each of these varied requirements. So the United States took over funding the program and redesignated it as the VZ-9AV Avrocar, with VZ standing for Experimental Vertical Flight, 9 for the 9th concept proposal, and AV for Avro, the aircraft's maker. Russell E. Lee, a curator at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, told Popular Mechanics, quote, The flying saucer configuration offers benefits. It's totally symmetrical, so in theory, it should be omnidirectional, if you can figure out how to redirect thrust in an instantaneous and efficient manner. Putting myself in the shoes of the designers in the early 50s, I would think it would be a viable candidate for further investigation. And crazy as it may seem, the program really did look promising for a time. It seemed, then, entirely possible that the United States may become the first nation on the planet to begin operating its own combat flying saucers. Frost's Avro car was to include six turbojet engines, which powered a central turbine that would be used to create a cushion of air beneath the aircraft, often called a ground effect. His team produced a 117-page report outlining their findings and offering some positively optimistic predictions. They believed the jet's exhaust would produce 20,000 pounds of thrust, which would be bolstered by the ground effect cushion to reach as high as 30,000 feet. Frost himself predicted the aircraft would be capable of speeds as high as Mach 4, with a range of 1,000 miles and an operational ceiling of over 100,000 feet. These figures would be impressive even today, where America's fastest intercept fighter, the F-15 EX Eagle II, can only achieve speeds as high as Mach 2.5 and has a service ceiling of 65,000 feet. So it goes without saying that in the 1950s, the Avrocar promised to literally change the face of air combat as the world knew it, as long as it worked. But it wasn't just fighters the Avrocar promised to replace. Former Air Force officer Bernard Lindenbaum recalled hearing one Army general remark that the UH-1 Huey that came to fame during Vietnam was to be the last helicopter the Army would buy, citing the game-changing technology offered by saucer programs like the Avrocar. So the U.S. military agreed to pony up the funding to build two functional prototypes that would put Frost's claims to the test in 1959. The craft was 18 feet in diameter, far smaller than Frost's intended design, but was built to serve as a technology demonstrator and testbed for further design tweaks. Shrinking the design also meant reducing the number of engines housed within the saucer to just three. And just as Frost predicted, the Avrocar really did take off as planned. But it only reached about three feet in the air above its cushion of exhaust before the aircraft became unstable and started to buck like a hubcap oscillating on its rim. The pilot was quickly forced to abort the flight and come back down, and further tests wouldn't fare much better. Despite experimenting with a multitude of changes, from different control surfaces to the addition of a tail, nothing seemed to stabilize the rocky Avrocar. It never flew higher than three feet off the ground, and never exceeded 30 knots, or only about 34 miles per hour. Despite Frost still fervently believing in the design, the program would ultimately be canceled in 1961. 
The Air Force's prototype Avro car would go on to spend time in custody of the Smithsonian, until it was given to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in 2007. A restoration team set about bringing the old flying saucer back to showroom condition, and it was unveiled to the public in 2008. The second prototype, on the other hand, still sits in boxes in Langley, Virginia. Despite the failure of the Avro car to become America's VTOL platform of the future, the concept would go on to prove feasible in future airframes like the British AV-8B Harrier II jump jet and of course the modern F-35B Joint Strike Fighter. The same approach to directing the flow of exhaust as it exits the aircraft to control the direction it flies in can also be found in advanced fighters like the F-22 Raptor and Russia's Su-35 both of which leverage thrust vectoring of similar principle to dramatically increase their maneuverability. The Avro car's circular shape, while certainly weird, isn't that far off from the shape used by reusable spacecraft to manage the extreme friction and heat of re-entry while keeping behavior and air currents predictable. As Robert Braun, a Georgia Tech professor of space technology who served as NASA's chief technologist from 2010 to 2011, reminded us, and I quote, from below, the Apollo capsule looks an awful lot like a flying saucer. And that'll do it for this week's edition of Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. Make sure you click like and subscribe down below this video if you liked today's content, and click on that bell icon so that you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.